Episode 43, Everleaf Pines, The Gathering. Fairies move swiftly through the trees, lone figures, some in pairs and others in groups. They pass through well-lit clusters of vesperals in soft bloom in the dark. The illumination of the vesperals made the areas further away a dark forest. The fae silently converged late in the night in and around an open sky gooseberry glade. Hundreds settled on the ground as others hung from the trees and sat atop large branches. They were summoned by the singing. Little Yalra stood beside Bullnosh in the center of the glade, holding the Bullnosh's ear. Newly come, Fay and Athrodoc brought Elvani baskets full of elder bread. As the two fairies sang the war sloth pylons, those who listened chewed on munch root. Whispers through the shadowy wood brought more war sloths, halflings, hobwalkies, yelkai, willow weirds, nymphs, joined by pipe mongrels, mongrels, dark satires, thorn maidens, and the armored polywog beetle fairies. Nighting wards spread the word through Everleaf, and Nepshun the fairy dragon arrived, as did several of the musk badger hedge guards. Silas sat beside the leprechauns, Humbrol and Stephus. The animals of the forest came, unafraid of the fae. Sable, mink, and deer approached as squirrels weighed down the closest branches. By the third song, all three covering those pylons known to all because they were located inside Everleaf, over a thousand glassy-eyed, munchroot-burning fairies sat in or surrounded the gooseberry glade. And in the very back, standing alone among the shadows, Dishra listened to the songs. She heard Bulnash's richly deep voice singing of journeys across Dagathar. The sylph singing was beautiful and pure of majestic valleys, springs, and friends made along the way. The thorn maiden looked down to see a press of polywogs around her. She opened her hand to find an elder sprout, a bantam blinking up at her, eyes always round. She popped it into her mouth as the bantam smiled. Looking back, she found she was now standing in the middle of a large group of sylvan beings gathered to hear the songs. A wash of energy flooded her inner being. The voice of the sylph and bullnosh took on new meanings, music taking on a life of its own as she burned the munch root. The fairies traveled as one back through the haunts of their youth, through forgotten sanctuaries, woods they once called home. They listened to Yalra as she made them remember who they were and not who, had, who they had become. Her words flowed through the glade with a power only elder bows could guide. By song did the sylph strengthen living bonds as she sang of friends and kin who were lost along the way. Bullnosh sang of their lives before the rift, long prior to the scattering of old. Together, the host of listening fairies entered the Song of the Sylph, sharing her memories of distant fairies hidden in other forests. Bullnosh boldly sang of those living isolated in Narwood Reach, in Faynot on the water, at Sothril's Grove in the north and in dangerous tree helm and distant splinter dark. The fairy bread burning carried their spirits as one to ancient falls and hidden meadows. War sloths and polywogs relived war-torn fields of battle as nymphs remembered lovers they had burrowed. Dishra's heart raced, threatening to pound right through her cage. Her vision blurred at seeing thousands of fairies sharing in a song as if they'd never been at war. She looked up through the trees and saw the shadow of the dragon, massive alabaster head, bowed as if in prayer. Throughout the glade, her thorn maiden sisters sat arm in arm with shars and jubilance. Dishra inhaled sharply, backing away, 
passing through fairies who were lost in the song. It was called being caught in the root. The words of the sylph sang away the shadows in their hearts. The fairy duo wrought healing where long had dwelled their hurt. Fairies shared, clinging one to another, none refusing the touch of Athrodoc. By the end of the eighth song, three thousand fairies pressed into the glade, silent nighting wards perched among the squirrels. The thorn maiden gazed up into the stars, choking back a sob. She fled as Yalra sang of splinter dark, of sylphs ensnared, and a witch they all once knew. Dishra did not see the three sarhawks high above amid the starry canopy. Winged dryads of Sothrol's grove did listen on high. The Athrodoc leader ran fast through the woods as if the faces of dead fairies she had killed could come back and haunt her heart. Mikkel and I had left the bark walk and went to Wheeler's tree. We shared elven brewed cider coffee and I listened without interrupting as Mikkel told me all about the battle in Shanadar, the escape from Sigil's Arch, and the grisly discovery of Trevor's mangled body in Dretchwald. It pained me to think that I had sent him into a trap. We changed the subject before Wheeler happened upon us. She was mourning Trevor. The lithe and very beautiful Nethyala was in and out tending to her needs. At least once a day we exchanged glances without words. I returned the misery by telling Mikkel of the death of Louis, the younger brother of Adias. Both rangers had been lost in the very first assignments I had given them. The two of them, with Cavan Nightshade still missing, made three rangers lost. By now, though we didn't say it, we all assumed Nightshade was dead. I now knew Abdias had departed Decker's port, and the news I received this morning told me that Matthias was coming to Everleaf with an army of dwarves from Emim Guard. Four Border Realm Rangers remaining. This hasn't happened since the last uprising. Obviously, we were being hunted. Mickle told me of the carrion women they rescued in the fingers of Deep Ore, and then I quietly related to him the private council I attended just this morning in the court of Elder Bows. There had only been a few of us invited. It had been a war council, and representing the Fae and Athrodoc were Ashray the Shar, Manax the War Sloth General, and the Thorn Maiden Dishra. The noble ones were represented by Alar Yell, the Ariel, and Sorok, the Hawkman. King Eurobor represented the army of Enchandrus. These six standing before Elderbows were told that they would lead the Fae and Athrodoc in an offensive against the enemy, and that the ambush was to be set up at the ruins of Barrowin, a place of tombs anciently occupied by men. There were others of us who were present as we listened to the great tree tell them not to fret, that he would join the battle with us. But in what capacity he did not say, and the fairies were curious. For thousands of years the tree had been still, and they were hard put at imagining the gigantic tree on the battlefield with them. If the offensive was unsuccessful, the fairies were to fall back the Elvani army of archers covering their retreat into the woods. Isarok, the elven commander, would lead the counter-offensive against the tired underworlders with fresh troops of elves, dwarves, and men. On the plain between Everleaf and Arbor Realm, the Duke of Emim Guard, Delmari, would position his dwarves. This force was reinforced with the Knights of Hinter Realm under Ethan Unsenhouse, the Arbor Realm Militia under Stanley, and the Men of the Scorched Earth following Clan Prince Cordon. Once the battle plans were laid and explained, the Archaic Tree talked for a while with the Alabaster Dragon in an old foreign tongue that no one knew that I understood. 
When even Ashray declared that she did not know the language, I knew then that the discussion was not meant for our ears. During the strange conversation, a sadness passed over Elder Bow's face and the white worm was stilled. Burn Breath's tail twitched once and he seemed to expand and grow as he bowed and to our puzzlement, his last words were in Sylvan, understood by all. It will be avenged. Lastly, there was left in the war council only Imaricus and myself. Elderbows addressed us together rather cryptically, saying that circumstance would dictate our duty. No specific assignment was given to either one of us. At the feet of Isaric was the Ark of Ison, the name of an ancient elven enchantress who had fallen in the wars against the Sand Kings. From the ancient box, Ashray extracted a white rod with odd symbols etched into it. She announced that this was the Rod of Revelation, which would give profound insight to the wielder of the intentions of the enemy. Additionally, one who was struck by the rod would instantly forget what he was doing, remaining dumbfounded for a spell. The second object she pulled out was a thunderstone, a wedged-shaped rock like a flint. It was handed to Manax. Though these items had not been removed from the Ark since the Battle of Ghoul Rune well over five centuries ago, the Thunderstone could actually be used once every nine years. When thrown at the ground, it knocked down all adversaries around its wielder, like a concentrated earthquake. A Laurel was given the Solar Shield, a divine craft artifact that emitted blinding light directly into the eyes of any who strike the shield with weapons. Eurobor was given a spearhead with jagged edges made of red metal that glowed bright crimson when it was aimed directly at the heart of an opponent. Ashray gave over the dangerous weapon to Dishra who inspected the old masterwork of grayish metal with a sylvan inscription down the blade that read, Avengiclus. She had given the thorn maiden a longsword. At the time I observed this, I did not know that the thorn maiden knew well that ancient sword that she had possessed it before. The enchanted blade grew sharper and sharper, the more powerful according to the holder's anger. The sixth and final weapon from the Ark of Ison was given to me, the only relic that had been assigned to a man. I gave it over to Mickle for inspection. It was an odd elven composite bow carved from an unusual oiled wood, slightly yellowed but with rings. Mickle was first to state the obvious. Josiah, this bow was carved from a trunk. Ashray heard his whisper. Ribwood of Treehelm from a very long time ago. It is the only place ribwoods remain in all of Dagathar. I looked at it too. Carved in elaborate lettering down the bow was the name Aeroloft. The carrion was archaic but still recognizable. The bow had been placed inside the Ark of Ison by my ancestor, Alec Aroloft. He had been First Ranger and he died shortly after the Battle of Gulrun, a venom from some underworld beast slowly eating away his life. Ashray told me that the ribwood bow was empowered by virtue. We learned that the seventh relic from the Ark was a terrible weapon of great power that belonged to the Dwarven race, a weapon of great antiquity forged from the steel of the Maul of Mygok the Titan, an historic enemy of the Emum Dwarves. It remained in possession of the Emum, and Gelmari informed them that it was to be brought by his army marching toward Everleaf. This great hammer was, was called Quakemaker. The war council had been brief. Elder Bose informed us that the Knolls were totally unprepared for what was about to befall them. 
that their race was in danger. We were also told that Craniacs and the Deep Ore Alliance had completely vanquished the Underworld Army against them, but that the King of Giants himself had fallen. Hearing this, the rippling muscles of Manax tensed under his fur. Ashray bowed her head, and Eurobor, Dishra, and Gelmari stared unbelievingly at the great tree. I had looked around and thought it odd that the Thorn Maiden had wiped her eyes. I could also tell that her display of emotion disturbed Manax. Elderbows instructed the Fae and Athrodoc to kill all the Umber Slogs as quickly as possible because the six-legged monsters were the foul offspring of the Dark Tree, born from larva that had harvested from the limbs of darkness. They were fed the life essence of the victims the Elvachi cast into the Maw Pits. Manax was to lead the Fae assault in Dishra, would remain concealed with her army of Athrodoc in the ruins of Barrowin for an ambush after the battle started. A fleet of boats and rafts were being prepared by the fisherfolk of Ada Lake to ferry the wounded to Decker's port. Should Everleaf and T.L. fall, the wounded young and women were to evacuate to Emum Guard as those remaining in the war would retreat to Feynot on the water to Narwood Reach and Arbor Realm. A few strange days these had been. Mickle went to sleep and I stayed awake until sunset, my mind adrift, pondering everything that happened. I too got comfortable and wheeled his bed. And as I drifted off, I saw Nethyala's silhouette in the door looking down at me. As sleep took me away, an image of the thorn maiden crying faded in my mind. Though I fell into a deep slumber in the dark of night, I came suddenly to my senses. Awake, I saw Wheela lying beside me. She was trancing. Unlike most other living beings, the fairies never slept. Ordinarily, they tranched for a short time and went on about their business. If injured or badly in need of rest, they nethered. The tree home was in shadow. No birds sang, and I knew it was very late. I blinked away the images of my mind. Countless unknown pictures evaporating within my mental landscape as pieces of memory dancing beyond the grasp of recollection. I vaguely recalled a storm. Not one that was here yet, but brewing. I sat up and closed my eyes. The afterimage of a dark tree burned into the blackness of my mind, as if I had been staring at elder bows for a long time. Weola came out of her short trance, and the apanthoi woman Darina began talking with her in high sylvan. Nethyala was sitting on a wicker swing, listening as the women giggled talking about Weola's pregnancy. Darina remarked that if it was possible, then she and Mikkel would have already had a whole litter of kittens. They spoke conspiratorially on the sexual prowess of men, and they seemed too engaged among themselves to notice me sit up and look at the water clock. My head swam with spectral forms, and the urge to get out and walk overcame me. When I stood, I felt as if I had just stood somewhere upon a high precipice below a heaven of incomprehensible vastness, and yet I felt larger than a giant studying what is small to ants. Stepping out of the trees into the wooded lane, I could see pinpoints of stars above the fragments of light from the windows of other trees. The sensation that I had been trapped at the perimeter between two worlds slowly pulled apart. The tree city of the Elvani was dark and quiet. Sentries were about, concealed in their woodland cloaks difficult to see, perched in special alcoves cut deep into the large pines. Somewhere near, someone played a slow, lilting tune on a flute beautifully that seemed to deepen the tranquility of T.L. City. As I walked past two elven guards, I saw a few white and black speckled drakes. They belonged to the wild elves, 
Only the Hadachi of Splinter Dark possess the dairy cow painted drakes. I wondered if they have brought some news. It was a very peaceful time as I walked the avenues, no one seeming to notice me, lying all over the place, wherever they found open ground. Off the walks were rolled up balls of razored armor polywog beetle fairies. They rested after their journey overland from Enchandrus. The warrior beetles were jovial and friendly, but I've been told that they were very fierce in combat. I knew that even now, under the black sky, there were many more groups of polywogs curled up at rest in the plains between Enchandrus and Everleaf. They would arrive by tomorrow. Something was astir in the wood. I saw fairies huddled in pairs and groups, share trancing. This act of memory melding was unknown to all but fairy kind. The fae tranced to rest and heal, but in share trancing they exchanged memories with those they touched. In some burrows beneath the spruce woods, elves had joined the fae and Athrodoc. Elves of every kind were also branch born. I could see their eyes in the moonlight. The fairies burned elderbred in trance, eyes wide while their minds were very far away. The tree city of Everleaf glowed in otherworldly hue beneath the cover of ancient pines, the glowing vesperals moon-blooming their aquamarine radiance. These flowers only bloom at night, brightest when the moon is high whether clouds conceal it or not. The blooms glow in their thousands, only in Everleaf Pines, concentrated around the elven city. Evander told me they're known as fairy lamps. After a while, I made it to the Barkwalk Court. Most of the hedge guard were gone. Two remained at post, but the musk badgers did not intercept me. I saw unusual light shimmering out of the long hall, coming from the dome inside. Elven guards talked quietly among themselves, and none paid me any notice as I stepped the hall of fused trees. An Elvani woman carrying an amphora, carefully on her shoulders, sauntered by the court entry. She said nothing to me, so I refrained from asking about the lights. Halfway across the bark walk court, I looked over at the great body of the alabaster worm, quietly at rest, curled protectively around the small form of Sir Cornelius sleeping on the ground. He had made camp right there in the court and was snoring. The thought crossed my mind that the old Sky Marshal was probably the safest person in all of Everleaf. Looking at the Polterians and Dragon, I then felt the weight of another stare. Searching about and looking into the trees, I found the old man of the woods standing alone a hundred or so feet outside the Barkwalk Court. His eyes stared at me saucer-wide, and he leaned forward. As more shimmering lights erupted from the Barkwalk Hall, his face lit up. He stared at me as if seeing me for the first time. Before I could turn around and approach him, he pointed down the Barkwalk and receded into the shadows. His words at the council echoed through my memory. Only by great loss shall they see what is to be gained. I began the long trek through the bark walk. The entwined branches and fused together trees were living walls of wood alive with shadows cast from the bright lights coming from the dome. Ahead, something was lying on the path in the hall. I approached and saw the form that cast a long shadow down the hall. It was Silas, exactly where Cornelius and I had left him when we came to the dome all those days ago. He was sprawled out comfortably as the tiny sylph Yalra used a bone comb on his coat, quietly grooming him. Yalra's white hair drifted in the air. I greeted her and she jerked her head toward me looking in my direction and I realized she may have been lightly trancing. Not wanting to disturb them, I walked forward into the dazzling light. When I first reached the dome, the lights were blinding and I, and I paused, giving my eyes time to adjust. The dome was virtually empty. Elderbose was in council with sixteen tall figures wearing white long robes with hoods. 
The tallest among them appeared human, for he was not wearing any hood and had translucent blue-white skin. Glowing so brilliantly, the entire dome reflected this luminosity. Even the golden light from the ancient cedar of Aden was drowned in its magnificence. The other hooded figure seemed to defer to this glowing godlike man. Not wanting to disturb this odd assembly and yet unable to turn away, I wandered quietly along the wall of entwined trees that formed the outer perimeter of the dome. As I moved looking down at them, I noticed that they all stood within the ring of the stones of fire, the circle of 360 white stones surrounding the little garden at the base of Elderbow's great girth. Seeing this, I surveyed the entire dome and discovered that not even Elderbow's daughters were present. What is going on? I had never seen such strange figures. I traversed about 300 paces along the upper edge of the dome to get a better view of the visitors. As I moved, the way became more difficult to travel, as if the air had thickened. Something, a barrier, invisible, pushed against me as if alive, seeking to resist my movement and imprison me in one place. I resolved to push forward, but the harder I tried, the more resistance I felt. The faster I stepped, the more lead in my feet became, and only with great effort was I able to continue forward. Why am I so hindered? My struggle persisted, and still I pushed forward. That I did not tire from the struggle at once struck me as unusual. It was as if by sheer will my body responded with lightly more force than the press against me, and for this reason alone I steadily moved forward. Another fifty feet brought me to a stop, icy chill spreading through my being. From my new vantage spot, I could see the faces of the fifteen strangers in white hoods. Round, glass-like mirrors that reflected the light. Never before had I seen such imposing and awesome figures. Curiosity burning my caution, I willed myself forward, and to my surprise, the air before me appeared to stretch. The resistance turned hot like giant billows trying to throw me back, but I refused. A step forward, leaning into a wind that was not there. Another step. Again. Then the air in front of my face tore open like an old sheet, and I poked my head through the rip and into a hauntingly beautiful music that pierced the silence, a song of might and power. The struggle ceased and the energy coursed through my body, and with a strength like a god, I broke through the border to no longer any feeling of resistance. I stepped out of one world and into another. Brilliant lights all around me pulsed to the cadence of this otherworldly song. Deluged by waves of musical sadness, I stared, I stared directly at the singer. But my vision became altered, and in shock and disbelief I froze as the air completely opened and revealed what was really all around me. My eyes and my mouth opened. I found myself standing shoulder to shoulder with unimaginably ancient beings all crowded around the breathtaking pillar of white light, covered in words that I knew not. I perceived that the pillar was alive and that it was aware of my presence. Standing before the pillar was the blue-white luminous figure with hu human features I had just seen in the dome, and standing with him were fifteen humans in white robes that looked no different than me. I was merely one among millions in a vast area far exceeding the dimensions of Elderbow's dome in Everleaf. The song that moved my soul was a chorus from the mouths of the mighty. In this congregation of the immortals, a fragment of omniscience flooded me, and I knew that this crowd was summoned to witness this most unusual event. Though I had never heard nor seen such indescribable beings, at that very instant I knew I was surrounded by holy ones, the chiefs of all their orders. These immortals were not gods, but servants, watchful guardians of the stars called solars, of worlds called planetars, arranged as leaders called decans, centenars, and the powerful time-bending chronicons. Deathly afraid while knowing also that I was safe from harm, my understanding was opened. The tale of Imaricus came to mind. And in the likeness of the gods did they make men. 
The 15 humans were navigators, the builders of the old tales. And what I had perceived to be a song was actually a speech. The blue-white figure in the visage of a man was the Eternal One, the maker of the gods themselves, and whatever he had said to the assembly of the immortals, I had missed. But the speaker now was Elder Bowes. His voice came out of the pillar at the, at the center of the multitude. For this end did I give them the box, that, that by my light they should see, by my word believe, and by my sacrifice live. Eons have passed since the war began, and yet they were the least of all created. All the gods my brethren created, the 108,000 realms, but it was I who created their borders. Since the beginning I was hidden on a den, a small world at the edge of a small galaxy on an unpopulated plain with my brother. He was banished, I was forgotten, but now our controversy shall end. They are my inheritance, Father, but not all of them will I claim. The race of men will be proven, for they themselves shall release their enemy, and he shall walk freely among them. Thus begins the age of men, last to learn of good and evil. Navigators be warned. Men that prevail shall succeed those who've fallen. The powerful words thundered over the heads of the assembly, reverberating threateningly. After only a slight pause of quiet, the masses themselves erupted together into a chorus of near equal magnitude, a maelstrom of confusion, a million questions from the mouths of beings that have been to billions of places. In the chaos that shattered the order of seconds before, I was reminded of the rioting of the Fae and the Athrodoc in the Council of Elder Bows. Am I witnessing a similar contention among the immortals? Voices of power poured all over me, through me, words of energy, force, and passion. The millions of voices coalesced into a mighty song of divine harmony that made me see visions. This music, a power that propelled thought beyond its normal perimeters. The immortals sang a terrible song fraught with histories and prophecies that shook everything, waves of notes laden with emotions beyond my capacity to feel, filling the air with a life all its own. I listened in awe, marveling at the sensations the song inflicted upon me as one removed from his body who could only feel the music rather than hear it. And at that moment I knew this was a funerary dirge that had not been sung since the beginning of time. They sang mightily of the death of a god. To my astonishment, the Eternal One raised his right hand and a living light filled the pillar of inscriptions amidst the assembly as the navigators bowed. And inside the shimmering pillar stood the figure of a man. I gazed upon Elder Bose, the golden limb, the navigator. The song of the immortal swept my being into places beyond the sea of time, deluging my mind with memories that did not belong to me, of destiny and fate, of the love of a father for the designs of his sons, of the necessity of evil and the development of good, and the utter simplicity of divine art, of light and shadow, movement and rest, and the perfect symmetry of all things natural. My soul resonated with revelations of time and space, synchronicity, prescience, unseen actualities, and mysteries I had not known before. I stood upon a high place as other worlds were open before me, and I beheld their populations. The notes of the song carried my mind beyond the fabric of worldly realities, and I was made to see the smallness of Aden in the vastness of the surrounding stars. I was astonished for the stars were suns. On the wings of my spirit, I was carried among these archons and immersed into the infinite through the paths of the angels, the hidden ways of immortals. I beheld holiness without ritual, sanctity without sacrifice, and patience when benefit is withheld. And I marveled, for these were the virtues of the immortal ones, of selfless servitude. My soul swelled with their significance in the divine order predestined by the gods, their splendor and might in the uncompromising force of their character. 
Their song of living music became my own, and that instant I understood that which was eternal. In a blink, the whole human genealogy opened in my mind, and I perceived where I fit in the divine plan. I experienced my future. And the incredible song that surrounded me changed to that of a solo, the entire countless millions pausing to listen intently to the music of one who sang about being born, about emerging from darkness, of returning from exile after being lost. The wonderful notes sounded as if they were emptying from me. And I saw the golden light filtering out from the great limbs of elder bows high above the dome in Everleaf. Solars, Archons, Planetars, Deccans, Centenars, and Chronicons stared at me and faded away as the dome reappeared. The assembly of the immortals had vanished and the dome was empty. I caught my breath in realization that the singing had come from my own soul. I had entered the song of the immortals and it had enraptured me. I found myself about 40 feet away from the tree, welded wall of the dome perimeter, with Elder Bo serenely looking down at me. The hint of a bemused smile was on his face. Fifteen round mirrored faces looked my way from their white hoods, but in the place where the Eternal One had been standing was now Olam, the green man, the old man of the woods, the silence in the dome so complete I felt compelled to speak. Who are you? I asked the old man. But he only smiled. I was about to ask again, but I heard a faraway cry, stifled but very clear. A weeping female came rushing out of the bark walk entrance and hurried down to the edge of the white stone ring around the great tree's trunk. As she collapsed to her hands and knees, I noticed that the hooded figures and the green man were now gone. The woman's torso racked with heaving as she tried to catch her breath. She never noticed my presence. What is it, my child? The archaic tree asked in concern, looking down upon the sobbing form of the thorn maiden Dishra. The Athrodoc woman tried to look up, but could not. Help me, father. Her voice was choked and desperate. I, I can't breathe. She struggled to speak but moaned instead and the sound froze my insides. My heart, my heart is molten in my chest. All of your commandments I have broken. In revolt I killed what I swore to protect. With hatred I buried alive what could not die under the sun. Most pitiful of fairies, deranged of nymphs, these thorns are my wick wicked testimony. Killer of my kin and hater of men. O oh, elder bows, please let me die on the field of battle forgiven. Dishra bowed her face to the ground and wept bitterly. Never had I witnessed such inhuman groaning and misery. The tiny faces on the flowers in the garden regarded her with expressions of sorrow and compassion. Elder Bose, too, looked down on her seemingly frail form, great brows arched at seeing her so wretched. I have already forgiven you, all of you that have come back under my limbs. The thorn maiden wailed, convulsed pitifully, oblivious to the crowd of fairies gathering behind her. Amazed, I watched as the dome began filling with throngs of Athrodoc, dark centaurs, crimson satires, the other thorn maidens, rotwood nymphs and dire pixies, plague fairies. I saw the wood-grained gigantic tree giant, the pythoness, a troop of rat-faced figures, some stitch fairies, a couple hobwalkies, and to my surprise, a gathering of wild elves from Splinter Dark. At least 700 forms gathered around Dishra and followed her example. They dropped to their haunches, folded their legs, or got on their hands and knees. None gave me any notice. The Athrodox sought redemption and many were crying or silently imploring elder bows 
to forgive them. From where I stood, I looked back up toward the bark walk entrance and saw three forms. The bull notch stood watching with drooping eyes. He appeared as if unsure that he should even be there. Little Yalra stood beside him, holding on to his ear. Next to her was Silas, cat eyes wide with astonishment. Dishra, nymph of little understanding, did you learn nothing from Imaricus? The loyal I have never lost, but the Athrodoc chose another way. You were never my enemy, but I allowed you to go by unexpected ways, to traverse paths unknown, that by trials, suffering, and separation you would learn the value of obedience. Your pain and fear has now given substance to truth. Now you believe more powerfully than they who merely blindly obeyed. Provided two paths, how can punishment result from the choosing? The value in a road lies in where it leads. One gains strength by experience. This will be the plight of men as well to enjoy discretion while chained to doctrines that damn him for using it. I am worthy of nothing but death, she said, voice quivering. I agree, for death is the gate of the holy. At this, Dishra looked up, at Elderbo startled. Stand up, Dishra, for you are my anointed vessel. The thorn maiden looked terrified and stood tremblingly between the great tree and the Athrodoc gathering. I, I, only the holy can be anointed, she rasped. Come forth, Athrodoc maiden. Walk among the stones of fire. My own heart leapt at these words and Dishra turned light green with fear as the host of the Athrodoc gasped. It was certain death for anything evil to pass over the white stones. Only the jubilance had ever been granted this privilege. I knew right then that something momentous was about to occur. Dishra was about to make history, but the significance of what I was seeing would not be fully realized until much later. The dome became quiet like deep old tombs, as Dishra stepped hesitantly over the white stones and walked in the garden among the fairy flowers that watched her with expressions of amazement. She looked frail and small so close to the archaic tree. The golden aura of Elder Bows enveloped her and she looked up into his ageless face. Dishra is my appointed weapon of war. She shall lead the Athrodoc in the defense of men, for theirs is a path only now beginning. I was shook violently. Am I falling? In the distance I heard Mikkel's voice. His words were far away but getting closer. Josiah, Josiah! When I sat up, my vision was blurry. Mikkel standing over me. I was in Wheeler's tree. Both the elf woman and Dorina sat staring at me with alarmed expressions. I wiped my eyes. The afterimage of a tree burned in my mind. Looking around, I saw Nethiala was not here. You were dreaming, Mikkel said flatly. Wheela and the pantheress exchanged glances, obviously upset. Dreaming is a human phenomenon shared by dwarves and some animals, but it was of it was a source of mystery to the Fae. Singing, you were singing, Josiah, the Elvani woman said uncomfortably, and Dorina nodded. It was so sad, but beautiful. We cannot understand it, though, Dorina added as Mikkel noticeably shrugged it off. Everything I experienced passed through the corridors of my mind. It was all clear except why I had been chosen to see what I had witnessed. Only by great loss shall they see. 
Do you remember your dream? asked Wheela curiously. But I did not answer. All the events of the past month were clear in my memory, and I had seen my part in the future. All three of them stared at me as I sat in silence ignoring them. I never made it to Talandathar. I don't know what the Oroclon is, but I now know that I was going back to Dimwood, to the ruins. Outside the windows, the greenery was appearing with the first light, but I knew it was going to be a dark day. They were still looking at me when I cleared my throat. Elder Bose is dead. This concludes Book 2 of the Phalorn Saga.